Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, Season 5, Episode 9. Uh, my name is James Donnelly. I'm the chairman of the CASA Group. Uh, coming you to you today uh, from the Laurentian Mountains in uh, Quebec uh, on vacation this week. But it's such an important um, webinar today. And with all the laws having been signed, except for, I think, one uh, by the governor, uh, it's not speculative anymore. We're we need to figure out what to do. And so to help me today, I have uh, back Ken Director, shareholder at the Becker Law Firm. And Ken is also the chair of the Becker's Community Association Practice Group. Uh, Don is on vacation this week. So Ken, thanks for uh, jumping in here again. I love your background. I just shouldn't say your background. I love the room you do this from. Thank you. I, I also love the fact that you use a photo that is old enough that I have more pepper than salt. Yeah, me too, me too. Well, everyone, today's topic is uh, on our new condo and HOA laws. Uh, you know, what, what's the effect? What do we need to know? Um, we have things affecting the condo and HOA, and we're going to do, uh, in fact, let's put up poll question one right away, uh, Mary Ness, to find out uh, our audience today. So uh, thank you so much. We had about 1,600 people register uh, today. And, uh, and an equal number of questions. So Ken, um, I've got notes that I'm not, not sure we'll get through, but uh, we do have the Q&A uh, that you can submit them. I will tell you, normally I'm pretty good at answering them today. I think volume may be a bit uh, tough to do. Um, we also often get uh, asked for past episodes of, uh, of our uh, association leadership series. Those are on the castgroup.com. And we also put, uh, links under resources and helpful links. If you click on there, we did put all these bills up there uh, for for reference in the future. Although Ken uh, is uh, a, a very um, a renowned uh, attorney in this space, um, if you're not his client, he's not giving le legal advice today. So uh, uh, please, um, uh, we appreciate all of your your thoughts, Ken. But um, I always like to give that disclaimer. And if there's any questions that we don't answer or you need um, some uh, help with, just email info at castlegroup.com and we have a team that'll that'll follow up with you. So, well, Ken, um, the agenda today is uh, is full, but I got to tell you, uh, I was just talking to you yesterday. I think you got in this business in 84 and I got in in 1988. And I think this may be one of the most change in the rules of the game since since I've been the been in the business. How, how, how about yourself? I would say that in terms of sheer volume, I agree. Uh, I would say that in terms of the weightiness of the changes, there are some that are fairly significant, and there's a lot that is not as significant. Got it. Well, I just shared the results of the first poll, and this is, can you see them, Ken? It's just yeah, about 50-50. We've, like we've got like an equal split for condos and HOAs. Yeah, well, that'll that'll serve us well. So uh, I'm going to take that off the screen. So everyone, um, today we're going to uh, have a, just a quick note on the Corporate Transparency Act, which actually happens to be federal legislation. Then we're going to jump into Florida, and there's so many different bills Ken and I decided to do it by, by topic as opposed to bill number. And, and, and we kind of bucketed into board member education, board meetings, official records, websites, hurricane protection, my safe Florida and Q and A. So let's, uh, let's jump in uh, on the Corporate Transparency Act. Um, Ken, this is a, a law that's gonna affect uh, most associations on this call. It's one that's been challenged on a constitutional basis, but as of right now, it is the law of the land. And I think that our associations are going to have to begin the compliance with this act, um, not being able to wait in, in hopes that maybe it gets overturned. So maybe just give our audience uh, your thoughts on uh, the act, um, who it applies to, and uh, should we be acting now? Uh, or do we wait? Well, with regard to the urgency factor, unlike the renewed requirements that came out over the past couple of years for reserve studies 
and milestone inspections where you need to find an available engineer or an available reserve analyst to do the work for you. In this instance, it's just a matter of going online and providing information. So I don't believe the same level of urgency would apply. Um, the, the, the Corporate Transparency Act is intended to allow the federal government to uncover attempts at money laundering and other nefarious financial activities. Um, it is targeted at smaller corporations. And I agree with James, the vast majority of the people listening will be subject to the act. Unless you, unless you have revenue of over $5 million and, and over 20 full-time employees. And although it's not been defined, I think full-time employees would not include people assigned to your property by the management company. I think it means your own employees. So I think very few associations are gonna fall outside those parameters. Um, what is required? As if it's not already hard enough to get people to be willing to serve on the board, they have to disclose to FinCEN, which is the government agency that is administering this, they have to disclose their name, their date of birth, their address, and a number from a valid ID, like a passport or a United States issued driver's license. So that's what's required. The federal government is promising all of this information will be closely held. Um, okay, promises are promises. But for the time being, I think everybody should operate on the assumption that they're going to have to comply before January 1, 2025. And I think rather than rushing to file, you should at least find the, the website, the FinCEN website, uh, and prepare yourself to fill out this information at year end. Um, for those of you that are going to have another board election before the end of the year, obviously the information could change. The last comment I'll make, James, is the information for individuals has to be from beneficial owners. And I don't think there's any way to escape the application of that definition to board members. What remains in question is whether it also applies to managers, but it most certainly applies to board members. Well, that's good. I, I, I mean, I, we feel similarly and we're having to get ready and um, for CAS compliance. Uh, we're gonna, uh, we don't want to have all of that information that you're required to submit. So, uh, we are going to license a, a third party encrypted software and, and provide that service um, so to make it easy uh, to comply. But I, I thought this was important because I think we've been waiting and I wanted Ken for you to opine on whether our audience is going to have to comply or not. And it, it, it looks like they are for the most part. For the time being, they should be preparing to comply. They don't need to rush again because it's just going to a website and filling in information. But they need to be prepared for it and they don't want to wait till, you know, the, when the ball drops on December 31st, 2024. Okay. All right. Um, I want to put up, I want to move into board, uh, the legislation that affects board meetings, Ken, and, and I'd like to put up poll question two, Baroness, to get a feel for um, uh, our audience's current status as it relates to um, have a board meeting participation policy because that, that we, there's some new rules around that. But Ken, um, we'll, uh, we'll wait for those answers to come in. Um, okay. There's a bit of nuance between condo and HOA, but let's start with condo. I don't know that we've had a requirement for numbers of board meetings for condos before. What, what's new? Well, if there were requirements, they would have been in the bylaws. But having done this for four decades, I don't recall seeing many, if any, bylaws that mandated a certain number of meetings. Um, a lot of this is driven by not just safety concerns, but complaints to legislators about boards that operate outside the bounds of the law. And I would say to the board members listening, which is probably most of the people listening, if I asked you to think about your board meetings over the past few years and the representation of the owners at those board meetings, is it predominantly the people who go along and get along or is it predominantly the people who wouldn't agree if the board says today's Wednesday? So you need to understand those are also the people who are speaking with the loudest volume to your legislators. So I don't know that requiring four board meetings a year accomplishes anything, but nonetheless, it is still there. And for those clients that have worked with me, I always, always recommend full compliance with the law with regard to the notice and the conducting of board meetings. 
Um, so yes, this is a first, James, but I, I don't find it to be particularly troubling. And, and so how many board meetings do, uh, con does condo now have to have? Four, one per quarter, I believe. Yeah, quarterly. And that's uh, not, honestly, I've, I can't think of any of my clients that don't, but uh, we also uh, can't have a lot of self-managed communities out there uh, listening today. And so uh, this will be very helpful for them as well. I'm going to share the results here uh, for everyone to see. Um, looks like we got just over half have a board meeting participation policy. Um, yeah. And, you know, the rest is I know or I don't know. So um, I do. So not only do we have to have meetings quarterly now for an HOA, that doesn't apply. Is there a requirement for number of meetings for an HOA, Ken? Not to my recollection. I don't think there was anything in this law on that, but but, let, but let's be clear. And I don't want to get into a lengthy lecture about what is a board meeting, but a quorum of the board together discussing association business is a board meeting. There's no such thing as executive session or a closed session. The statute makes a few exceptions for when the board can meet in closed session, uh, but you need to have board meetings. They need to be noticed. They need to be open. Um, and I, I would tell you that given the, the advances in technology and the availability for people, including the board members, to attend by Zoom or even by, by speakerphone, there's really no excuse not to have at least one board meeting per quarter. Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, talk to us about uh, the expansion of rights for members to speak at a board meeting. Uh, well, what, this, how, yeah, how does that going to impact us? This is an interesting... Well, first of all... <laughs> I've discussed this with a few of my colleagues, including Donna, who regularly appears on this webinar with you. And she says, everybody needs to be prepared for longer board meetings. Um, and, and I think that's pretty much a certainty. Um, the new law gives the members the right to ask questions at the board meeting regarding the status of construction projects, um, fiscal operation or fiscal performance year to date. But then there's a catch all, anything else affecting the association. And that provision is, to my mind, in conflict with the provision of the statute that requires the board to have an agenda and only take up topics that are not on the agenda if it's an emergency and it's approved by a majority plus one of the board. So my attitude with regard to this new law until the division or a court says otherwise is if the question is about something the board members can respond to, like what is the status of a construction project, or have the, the treasurer talk about where we are year to date in terms of projected expenses and revenues, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, but you have to remember the purpose of an agenda is A, for the board members to be able to come prepared to speak intelligently and conduct a business-like discussion, and B, for the members to know what's gonna be discussed so they can attend if something that is important to them is going to be discussed. So with regard to the right to ask questions, I think the board members are gonna to have to use a certain amount of discretion to identify what can easily be discussed, which is basically status reports without getting too far into the weeds. But for items that, that are a bit more controversial, like should we fire the landscaping company? Uh, should we adopt new rules for guests at the pool? What have you? I think on those kinds of questions, the board members should punt and say, we will have a more fulsome discussion of that and we'll put it on the agenda for a future board meeting so that the people who might wanna participate in that discussion will know that it's gonna come up. That's how I think the new law should be applied. Okay, and that, that specific uh, provision is, is a condo provision. That is um, correct. What about, um, uh, there's two questions that are popping up. I'm keeping an eye on the, uh, the Q&A. Uh, first of all, Mariness, uh, there's a lot of people asking for um, the, uh, the C, uh, Corporate Transparency Act website. Let's put that up on a link on calsgroup.com. Uh, and secondly, there's a lot of questions on this topic. Can about Zoom, can we still do Zoom meetings yes. uh, or, or hold our meetings by Zoom? You've been permitted to hold Zoom meetings for a long time and you've been permitted to hold board meetings using speakerphones for a long time. Yep. I and would point out that the board is not required to make Zoom available to every member, but if you're gonna have board members attend by Zoom, uh, I don't see any reason, particularly since you're just gonna create consternation not to allow members to attend by Zoom. And um, there's a, a bunch of questions, Ken, on when does the meeting participation provision that applies to condo, when does it um, become effective? Is that immediately or is that January 1? It became effective July 1st. 
Yeah. Okay. Two things about meetings that I know you're probably going to ask me about. Uh, one is with regard to the no new notice requirements for meetings where contracts are going to be considered and to discuss the importance of having protocols. Um, from a management perspective, what are your thoughts on, on meeting protocols? What, what are your managers typically recommend? Do they recommend having protocols? In terms of participation? Yes. Yeah, I, I think um, especially to your point where it's often the people that come to the meeting because they have a beef to take out, it needs to be controlled. And uh, to have those protocols agreed on, published, communicated, and gives enforced. The, and, and enforced. And it gives the board something to look to to keep their meeting moving along. I think it's worth mentioning, James, that I, I get this question a lot. You know, if somebody attempts to filibuster or, or just take over the meeting, some board members are inclined to just adjourn. I generally advise against that because you've now allowed somebody to come to a meeting and divert the board from conducting its business. Um, I, I, I'm not suggesting that you start fist fights or you just start trying to shout people down, but I would never let someone who wants to filibuster about a topic that is not on the agenda or even about a topic that isn't on the agenda. I don't think you should allow that kind of person to shut down a board meeting. Yeah, I agree. I agree. The other thing I wanted to mention, though, on the condo side, and by the way, uh, there's some questions coming in whether the uh, meeting uh, um, frequency and participation apply to co-ops. Uh, it was not added to my recollection to the co-op statute. Yeah, I, I, that's my again, again, the co-ops that are that are here with us, um, I can't imagine you have less than four properly noticed open board meetings per year. Uh, I would be shocked if you don't. Yeah. And frankly, you should because you've got important decisions to make and they've got to be made in a, in a legally, procedurally correct manner. The other one that has caught our eye on the management side is, and this is a, another condo one, and, and that is that every goods and services contract over $2,500 that's going to be voted on at a meeting has to be distributed with the agenda, including the, the contract. So we're going to be sending out all kind uh, 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 by a factor, the number of, or the amount, and I say number because if it's hard copy, it is numbered. So um, talk to us about that. And my thinking is from a management perspective and from our audience perspective, we have to get our members agreeing to electronic communications because otherwise we're just gonna be pumping paper out. And you'd be surprised in some of our communities, they, they haven't opted in, but I guess it's a two part question. One, uh, talk to us about having to distribute contracts before votes and two, um, do you agree that we need to get everyone on electronic communications? Well, let's deal with the easy one first. Yes, on the second question. We live in a digital age. E even people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s have emails so they can see their kids, their grandkids, their great-grandkids. Uh, and frankly, I don't know why anybody would prefer to get important notifications from the association by mail when they can have them instantaneously wherever they are in the world where they've got an internet connection. But let's, let's go to the more challenging question, which is the distrib distribution of a copy of a proposed contract. Um, most board meetings, the vast majority of board meetings, do not have to have notice posted and mailed to everybody. For most board meetings, including the approval of contracts, unless you're going to levy a special assessment, unless you're there to adopt a budget, unless you're there to adopt rules regarding the use of the units or set insurance deductibles or implement online voting, those, the rest of the board meetings are noticed by the posting of a 48-hour notice with an agenda. So I don't know what to say to you other than perhaps buy a bigger bulletin board because if you're entering into a construction contract and you have a contractor who's proposing an AIA contract, hopefully with an addendum prepared by your council to protect your interests, you could have over 100 pages there. So I don't know how you post that contract together with the notice of the meeting. I just, I don't know how you do it. Now, I suppose if everybody agrees to accept notice by email, you could say on the notice that we've emailed this to everybody, but not everybody's going to accept email. Can we, um, can we say, uh, post it to the website, which is, uh, we're going to talk about that in a minute, but, but 
can we put that contract on the website and simply send out our notice to say, please reference website? The statute is unclear. I would like to think the answer to that is yes, because if the legislature saw fit to allow associations, particularly condos, to take an, an official records request, which we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, and say to the person who submits it, all of this information is available on the website, here is the link, then why shouldn't you also be able to direct people to the website to see the contract that you're gonna be considering? But the statute does not use the same language in both instances, so it's not clear. Yeah, and I, I'd like our audience to know, and you've shared with me already, Ken, that like all laws, they sound good until you have to implement them, and then you need a glitch bill to, to, to make it work. So already <laughs> in the works amongst the legal community is a proposal for the legislature to fix these bills next year. But we, we got to talk about what we have right now. And okay. Some of them don't even sound good. Yeah, I know. There's one other thing on, on, on the board meetings and um, and, and in the in the whole HOA bill can that CAMs have to attend at least once one board meeting a, a year. Not not that we don't, but it's now the law, and we have to post the CAMs duties and hours. Uh, and so make the, and make the management contract available. And make the management contract. So, so this is a this is a change, and uh, obviously. You know, for management companies like ours, you know, we're going to do it globally, but for self-managed or may, I think we have some managers of, of self-managed communities uh, online today. Um, this is something that it's just an, another change and it, it affects the HOAs. So I wanted and, to bring that uh, one up. Uh, let me interject if I may, James, pardon the interruption, but that amendment was to chapter 468. So it wasn't an amendment to chapter 720. So those requirements, to my mind, apply to all three types of associations. Yeah. So I think our our our, uh, our audience knows 718 is condo and, and 719 is co-op and 720 is, is HOAs, but 468 is the licensing uh, statute that would apply to all of them, I think is what you're saying. Well, it, the, the, that statute has been there for a long time and it applies to the management industry, whether individual man managers or management companies. And it does not distinguish between whether you're managing a condo or co-op or an HOA. Okay, we gotta keep going, we have a lot. And uh, the next one I wanna talk about is board member education. This is a, um, an expansion uh, of, of the current requirements. So um, maybe give us the update, the, the biggest changes in the condo, uh, What what changes are there for we as board members of condos for our educational requirements, Ken? Well, the legislature continues to make it more and more attractive to serve on the board of your community. I, and I, now they're making it more and more attractive to be a community association manager. Yeah. Um, look, I, I, I agree with the concept that board members should conduct meetings in a professional, organized, efficient manner. And in order to do that, you've got to know what you're doing. You can't just show up for meetings without having read the supporting materials, without knowing what, what's on the agenda and what materials need to be read to make an informed decision. So I don't have a problem with board members educating themselves. Um, for condos, the certification course is four hours. I will tell you that ours has been recorded and will be online within the next couple of weeks. And we recorded ours, ours in four hour, one hour segments, four one hour segments, each segment being presented by a different group of presenters. What I don't know yet is whether or not a board member is going to have to sit through a four hour marathon in one sitting or whether you can do it a piece at a time. I would like to think that you would be able to do it a piece of, at a time, but ours will be up and, and ours is, has been recorded, as I said, in four one hour segments so that it's a little bit easier for people to process. I don't think anybody wants to watch a board certification class that is longer than Titanic. Uh, and just so we're clear, if you do that, it's good for seven years as long as you're uninterrupted on the board. Correct. And all new board members have to take the four hour course. And for existing board members, you've got to take uh, the one hour um, continuing Legal education update. by the beginning of January 2025. And every year thereafter, one hour of continuing education. Yeah. Well, uh, that's. Um, and then uh, for HOA, they have to do uh, uh, approved board member education within 90 days of being elected. 
Correct. Right. And, it's four, yeah. and it's four hours unless the community is over 2,500, which is eight hours. I also want to point out that for the first time, the legislature has gotten even more specific about what has to be covered in a board certification course. And I'm sure it comes as no surprise that for condos, it includes the structural integrity reserve study, the milestone inspections, a record keeping and records production, elections, financial transparency, uh, meetings and fines. And most of those that are applicable to HOAs are repeated in the HOA statute as being mandatory parts of the curriculum for the board cert course. Okay. Uh, well, more work for our boards. I'm sure they're very excited. Um, well, more education for the boards, which- well, that's another way to, to look at it. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put on my rose colored glasses for everybody. Well, and I do think the one hour legal update each year is really good because, um, you know, you guys all put all these programs on, you and your your peers in the industry, and they're, we take them from you. So it's, they're very good. And, and for the people listening who are clients of, of the firm, you probably received yesterday our 2024 legislative guidebook, which walks you through everything that James and I are discussing about and more. Okay. I want to move on to official records. Another one that is keeping me up at night in terms of compliance. I want to put up uh, poll question three, Marinesse, uh, which has two questions in it. So please answer them both. Um, but yeah, I think you may have to scroll down to get the second question answered. The uh, can where I'm going here is um, the expansion of what is official records, um, the obligation to move them if you're at, for a management company or can if you're terminated. Um, records inspection and and the introduction of something called a checklist. Yeah. Um, so maybe just um, let's start with uh, what has uh, how has the uh, official records definition expanded? Okay. I, I don't mean for you to get you don't have to get granular, but what do we need to know? Um, if I may, a, a very brief final comment on board member education. Yeah. Uh, there are tons and tons of resource materials out there to educate the board on these topics and others. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with my partner, Donna DiMaggio Berger, she does an excellent podcast. And she probably has close to 70 or more podcasts posted online that cover most of these topics and many others. So for board members who actually want to learn, there's plenty of opportunity to educate yourself. With regard to switching gears back now to official records, um, the checklist is a new requirement. Um, and it only serves to underscore the importance of having a rule and protocols for how to handle document inspections. Uh, I will also tell you that when you look at a management contract, one of the things that you should look at is whether or not part of the manager's duties are to handle records inspections and whether or not the the management company or the manager is going to have a designated email address for people to submit official records requests and which is going to be monitored on a daily basis. So let's talk about the checklist. I've seen thousands of official records requests and James, so have all your managers. Sometimes the records requests say we want to see the minutes of all board meetings since January 1, 2022 through the present date. That's easy. You know how to identify those records. Some, board, some records requests are written in very broad, general terms. So how do you prepare a checklist when somebody has asked for something that could involve thousands of pages? By the way, one of the benefits of having a records inspection rule is that you can limit the frequency and scope of these requests and volume of these requests and the time that can be taken up by your staff to answer these requests. So. I have taken the position, and I don't know if the division will agree with me, but I have taken the position that if an owner provides a records inspection request that has particularity as the records they want to see, then the checklist should have the same level of particularity. If the records request includes broad, generalized statements as to the types of records they want to see, I think the checklist should likewise broadly describe the types of records that were produced. Otherwise, you could be developing a checklist that is literally 100 pages long. 
And I think it's worth it to encourage your, your owners to submit detailed requests as opposed to broad sweeping requests. But it is a requirement. And it's also another reason to have a records inspection rule. Um, I, uh, I shared the results there, Ken. Uh, uh, for, does your association have a written records retention policy? There's 46%. And does your association have a written records inspection policy? Uh, 38%. Um, so uh, that means there's, an, uh, there's room for improvement amongst our associations. And let's start with the, the records retention policy. Uh, we can't give an owner a record we don't have. And there ha has been some expansion in the le legislation of what we need to retain and how long. So um, I guess uh, uh, there's the need, a comment on the need for a records retention policy. And then uh, obviously we're going to have to update it now. Even if you, if you have one, you should update it. Well, I, I think the records retention, retention policy starts with what the statute requires you to have. Because yeah. the statute is is sweeping and at the same time specific as the records you are required to have, and it specifies for how long you need to keep records. Uh, for certain documents, you have to keep them since inception. Primarily, that applies to the governing documents themselves. Um, for voting records, you have to keep those for one year, and that's for voting records at membership meetings. For the rest of the records, it's seven years. So if you're gonna adopt a records retention policy, I guess one of the places to start is to identify those records that can be purged once they're more than seven years old. I think the more important protocol is the records inspection protocol because there are significant penalties and there are now even criminal penalties for botched records inspections. I don't want to get into those. I think criminalizing civil uh, misbehavior is, is a bit troubling, but I think it, it, there has to be a way for each of your communities to handle records inspection requests in a uniform, efficient, organized, consistent manner. And the best way to do that is to have a rule that you can publish to the community. When you send a response to an owner who has submitted a request saying, we received your request, on X date at X hour, and by the way, attached is a copy of our records inspection rules, so you'll know what our, what our obligations are under the rule and what your rights are under the rule. Uh, I, I cannot overstate the importance of having this kind of a policy, if for no other reason, to make sure that these inspection requests are handled in a uniform and consistent manner. Couple of follow-ups there, Ken. Um, I, I think that, uh, for everyone on this call that doesn't have this inspection process documented, it, it needs to be done. And if you do have it, it needs to be updated. But I did read in the legislation that we can uh, refer uh, the owner who's requesting the documents. By the way, there was a question on the board, who's doing these inspections? These are owners asking to inspect the association's records. We can actually refer the owner to the website if the data is there. Is that correct? Correct. And we'll talk about websites in a few minutes, but the statute has specific requirements for what has to be posted on the website. That does not mean that you cannot post more than what is required on the website. And the Act specifically says, the Condo Act specifically says, that you can respond to an official records request by directing the requesting owner to the website in lieu of producing the records. And um, the and, uh, records have to be produced in 10 business days. They have to be made available within 10 business days. That is correct. Okay. Uh, by okay. the way, I also want to mention with regard to records, it's something you and I talked about, James, which is that for a company transitioning from one management company to another, the manager or management company must produce, must turn over all records it has in its possession within 20 days of the termination of the contract or within 20 days of receipt of a written request. It's interesting, I had a call just this week from a condo association in Boca Raton that was having trouble getting records back from their former management company. And they were quite delighted to know about this new provision of the law. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the, the reality is uh, Ken, and, and you brought up the criminalization of 
of, of a service that we're all doing to our for our communities. You and I decided not to address that in that the purpose of those that are for willful neglect of, of, of the law and anyone on this webinar is not going to fall into that category. So as I, much sure as hope it's, I sure hope not. But it's also anything that you do in terms of concealing records in furtherance of a crime. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't know how to put it more bluntly than to say, you know, just follow the law, have a rule in place, follow it, and don't engage in chicanery with records. And don't engage in the kind of conduct that would make you want to conceal records. Uh, by the way, those 10, uh, 10 days for producing requ uh, requested documents and 20 days to transfer documents are business days. That's correct. Uh, that question came up uh, on the, on the Q&A. Okay, uh, we're, we're doing well here. 22 minutes left here, and we're going to move on to websites. So uh, there's been a change as to who uh, has to have a website. So let's start with that, Ken. Um, let me see. Actually, can we put up a, a poll question for Mariness? Let's see who of our audience have websites. And while we're getting those results, Ken, both condo and HOA, do I need to have a website? And 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 who is required to have a website? Well, I would start by saying to everyone listening, regardless of the size of your condo or your HOA, it's 2024. And it's hard to believe that 2024 is almost half is more than halfway over at this point. Um, time moves so slowly when I was a kid. Now it just flies by me. But having a website is good for business. It enables you to make information available to your owners, to your board members, to prospective purchasers. It enables you to advertise your community. And it takes some of the burden off of the board and management for people who want to know something and, and can go to a website, particularly the next generation of owners that is coming up who have grown up in front of a computer. I think having a website should not be something you look at in terms of whether or not we have to. I think you should look at it in terms of the benefits that it confers on you as an ongoing operation and as a business because the operation of associ an association is a significant business entity. With regard to the thresholds though, up until this year, condominiums had to have at least 150 units in them to be required to have a website. That number was dramatically reduced to 25. So condominiums that have more than 25 units have to have a website up and running by January 1, 2026. Again, I'm not suggesting you wait on it, but you do have some time for the smaller condos. For the homeowners associations, if you have more than 100 residences in the HOA, you're required to have a website by January 1, 2025. But I'm a big believer in having websites and I'm a big believer in communities using technology to facilitate operations and to facilitate owner participation. Just capturing some questions here coming in, Ken. Is the management company's website acceptable to comply with this? Well, that's a sort of a difficult question to answer because it depends on what you mean. A lot of management companies will make a website part of their service. Um, the problem with that approach is a lot of management companies have a, a shelf life with an association of maybe 18 months, two years. Um, if the management company has your website and you terminate your relationship with the management company, you're now out of compliance with the statute because you no longer have a website because a management company that you've parted company with is not going to continue to host your website. Yeah. I, I think there's two, by the way, I, I just um, po posted the results. So we got... Probably if you add in half of the I don't knows, we probably have 75% of our our audience already have websites. So that's not yeah. surprising and it's good. And I'm guessing some of those 25% may now have to. A uh, couple of comments. Number one, I, I think it's way better for it to be property specific. Uh, and two, a lot of management companies, including ours, have basically a mobile application. It's not a website. Um, and that's also allowed for it in the statute. Um, and 
all management companies, all good management companies are going to provide that information to, to move it forward. And now, frankly, it's required by law. So um, I think that it's best to have you know, your own website or your management company's app that has a specific page for your community uh, would be my answer to that question. Um, yeah, and then uh, another one I just wanted to address uh, under the website, it came up a couple of times under official records. And, and I'm frankly, as a management company, we're concerned about this too. All of the contracts have to be posted to this website and uh, all of the vendors are like, hey, uh, my contract's out there for public consumption. Um, and that's not very good, but it, it, it doesn't have to be on the public page. It can be on the owner only page and kind of behind the, the community firewall. You know, the statute actually requires that you have, uh, have a, a page that is only accessible by your owners. And I can't imagine why you wouldn't have that. But I would also say to the, to the contractors to say, there's nothing confidential about your contracts under the applicable statutes anyway, which means any owner could request a copy and have the right to inspect and make a copy of your contract with the association. So putting that on the website doesn't change the, the scope of persons who have access to your contract. Okay, uh, anything else on official records or websites, Ken, that we missed? Um, and I'm just doing uh, a quick, go ahead. We talked we talk, we talk very, very briefly about the importance of having a records inspection protocol or a rule. And I cannot overstate the importance of that because you may have people who use records inspection requests as a sword to tie up your staff, to tie up your management office. Uh, just and that's in a lot of instances they submit the request. You have to go through hours of pulling records, and then they don't show up. Um, so having a records inspection rule is important for the owners to know what they're entitled to and how much they're entitled to and how frequently they're entitled to it, but also for the board, future boards, current and future managers to have a, a system to work with. Uh, I cannot overstate the importance of that with all the new regulations, even the criminalization of certain botched records inspections. It's important that you do it right. Okay, uh, we are gonna now move on to hurricane projection. It's interesting, there's some new requirements in both the condo and the HOA. Um, so let's start with condo. Uh, 718 now has a definition of hurricane protection and it's clearly driving clarity on who's responsible and, 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 and the related costs thereof. So I know that's a little open-ended, but talk to us about What's new with hurricane protection first with condos? Well, you identified the first thing, which is the definition, which is not earth shattering. It's, it's what you would expect. Also, all new condos are going to be required to have in their declaration a designation of who's responsible for hurricane protection. Yeah. Um, you know, we live in South Florida, and if you look at the calendar, we are headed toward the peak of hurricane season. Hurricane protection, the importance of hurricane protection cannot be overstated. So I have always been of the opinion that it is good for your declaration to very specifically and clearly address who is responsible for hurricane protection, particularly on the windows and sliding glass doors in the walls bounding the units. Most communities prefer for the owners to be responsible. I don't know if that's monetarily driven, um, but either way, you've got to choose. And I would say, say to those of you listening where you have a significant percentage of your owners who already have hurricane protection, wouldn't you expect them to vote in favor of an amendment that will require everybody else to get on board? Because if, if James has hurricane protection on his unit and the people on the floors above him, although no one lives above James, um, if for the people on the floors above him, if they don't have hurricane protection, where's the water going to go when it comes into the building? So we haven't even talked about the benefit of the reduction of your insurance premium and the reduction of your exposure for a huge windstorm deductible if your building is properly sealed from the outside with regard to hurricane protection. The new statute creates actually creates a conundrum on a long-standing subject with regard to hurricane protection. First of all, let's talk about the easy part. You must, 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 as a board, 
adopt guidelines for hurricane protection, particularly shutters. If you have no guidelines, it basically means anything goes. I don't think you want people putting up red, green, purple hurricane shutters. So you need to adopt guidelines as to color. Uh, I've seen some buildings where the hurricane shutters are at the perimeter railing, where other units have hurricane shutters flush against the sliding glass doors. I even remember one where the hurricane shutters were diagonal across the balcony. That doesn't do much for the aesthetic harmony of the building from the exterior. So you need to have guidelines for the types of shutters, the code compliance, and yes, you can be stricter than the minimal code requirements for hurricane protection, but you need to have these criteria, again, for the same reason I advocated in favor of a records inspection rule, so that the management and the board, and including future management and board members, can apply the guidelines for hurricane shutters in a consistent and uniform manner, and so that the owners and the hurricane shutter install installers know what is permitted at your community. Yeah, I think, um, look, at this has evolved over a long period of time, Ken, and uh, there weren't any rules, and then people took it upon themselves, rightly so, to protect themselves. And and, and and I think what this law is doing, and, and it's appropriate, is we, we need hard and fast rules. We need to know who's responsible, and there needs to be some consistency. So as I think this is a good law. <laughs> Um, and, and your declaration should specify who's responsible for providing the hurricane protection so there's not a debate about it. Yeah. I, I want to get to the second issue in the new statute, though, before we leave it. Because yeah. I think we're running short on time, but it's important. No. For, for decades, and when an owner made an upgrade to the exterior of the building that benefited only his or her unit, the owner was responsible for that upgrade, including removal and reinstallation if the association had to paint the building or do concrete repair. This new statute has some bizarre language that says that the association is responsible for the cost of removal and reinstallation of hurricane protection. That is 718.1135D. Now there is a provision 718.113.5E that says where the owner's responsible for reinstalling, it's enforceable. I have to read both of those provisions to mean something. I don't think they cancel each other out. So what I have been telling my clients is that if your declaration makes the owner responsible for removal and reinstallation of the hurricane shutters, you may enforce that. But if your declaration is silent on this, the association is going to have to absorb those costs under the preceding paragraph in that statute. Two more clarifications. Um, one is that I did read in the legislation that the, uh, the implementation of the hurricane protection is not a material change that requires a vote. Correct. I think that's important. Correct. And, and then in the HOA world, uh, HB 293, I believe applies to HOAs where you have to have the hurricane protection specifications even for the homes. But I believe that 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 statute for HOAs specifically says that you cannot refuse an owner's request to have shutters if they want to. All the more reason to have, as you just suggested, James, to have guidelines so that there's some consistency in the appearance of the installations. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Uh, we got a few minutes left and I got a bunch of uh, stuff on the board here, but I did, we've had a lot of questions on the uh, uh, House Bill 1029, uh, My Safe Florida. And this is a, allegedly a pot of money that condos can apply for, uh, for hurricane protection. And I think if they'll match $1 for every two spent by a, a condominium. Um, thoughts on this? And it's, it hasn't been spelled out and defined. Um, so uh, I don't know where we go with this. I have my clients saying, let's apply, and we can't yet. But um, I think you're going to have very few happy people and a whole bunch of unhappy. What are your thoughts? Uh, I, I agree. <laughs> I, I, let me add to that by saying, as was the case with the Miami Date Fund that did attempted to do something similar to this, the money is going to go fast. This is not a grant program where you just apply and you're sent some money. This is a matching funds reimbursement program for certain approved projects. Your project has to be approved 
as being suitable for reimbursement from the MySafe Florida program. And you have to have done the work to apply for reimbursement. Um, for those who are clients of my firm, we've designated one particular lawyer to sort of shepherd clients through this because it's, it's a moving target. I don't even know if the application forms are online yet. I don't believe they are. Um, but if you're engaging in a project, particularly one that involves hardening the shell of your building with hurricane protection, uh, you should consider applying for this because that is, I, I believe, precisely what this was intended to promote. Yeah. Okay, a couple more. I've had some questions whether this webinar uh, uh, meets a CEU requirement, and the answer is no. Uh, we're, we're doing this for, as a public service, uh, not, uh, not to meet CEU requirements. Um, and, and then I had a couple more questions on the, the time. Uh, um, when does the hurricane protection laws take effect? Is it immediate? Immediate, but yeah. the deadlines are, they're, they're a little bit down the road, um, but bear in mind, I, a matter of fact, those, those laws don't necessarily impose specific deadlines. The new laws don't mandate hurricane protection. They just provide vehicles for the association to do so. Now, I will tell you that if you're going to amend your declaration to mandate hurricane protection, particularly if you're gonna require the owners to provide it, the amendment needs to have a deadline and it has to be a realistic deadline. And the amendment also has to have some teeth in it so that for those owners who choose not to comply, the association has some recourse, which could frankly include the association installing the shutters and charging back the unit in the same way as assessment would be charged, which is actually provided for in the statute. Okay. So I don't think yeah. there's a deadline there. James, there was one other topic that you and I discussed that we haven't mentioned yet. And in the six minutes we've got left, I wanted to mention it because we talked about some of the new laws relative to camps, to community association managers and community association management firms. And the issue concerns bids and conflicts. Uh, for a project over, I can't remember the threshold, what it was, maybe it was 2,500, but for projects where the management company has a financial interest or the outside vendor has a financial interest in the management company, uh, you have to get multiple bids. But I think the, the, more, the more important issue is management companies make a lot of different services available to their customers. And that's a good thing. Uh, that's part of the reason you hire a, a management company. They have more resources. They can make uh, different vendors available to you. But where the management company has a relationship with a vendor where there's some financial interest on the part of the management company in referring you to that vendor, that has to be disclosed. And I would use as an example that a lot of management companies have relationships with lenders. And where the lender is directed to an association by the manager, there are circumstances where the manager or management company get, get a, a gratuity from the bank. I'm not gonna call it a kick, kickback because that's not necessarily what it is. But sometimes that remuneration to the manager or management company means that the, the cost for closing the points or even the interest rate to the ultimate consumer, which is the association, can be higher. So those types of arrangements have to be disclosed to the customer, and the customer is the association. And I think that's an important change. I think so, too. I, I, I think, you know, different management companies have... I mean, they have landscaping and restoration. They have all kinds of things. Those all have to be disclosed now. And, and the lender ones, uh, as an example, capital doesn't participate in that, but we do charge our clients uh, per our contract, not from the bank. We, we charge them directly a fee on our Schedule D for arranging loans. But of course, it's, it, it's disclosed. But it is a good point. I think we're all going to have to look at our management contracts and, and vendors and make sure that there are no financial interests in that. And there's one topic that's literally been the number one question, and we decided we weren't going to uh, deep dive into it. But I, I do. Uh, the, the question is on the work vehicles in the community. What what's changed on that? Uh, it's it's been liberalized, and and frankly, this is a provision. If you have something in your documents, I don't know how a court will rule on the constitutionality of this change. Now, I'm not going to spend the limited time we have left going through 
an explanation of constitutional, unconstitutional impairment of contracts, but the declaration is a contract. And the contracts clause of both the federal and the state of Florida constitution say that the state may not enact a law that impairs existing contracts. And I emphasize the state, the federal government can do what they want, but the state cannot enact a law. So if you have something in your documents with regard to where a commercial vehicle is required to be parked, I don't know how this is going to shake out in terms of the enforceability of this new restriction, but it does allow the property owner to park the vehicle wherever uh, parking is provided for on the lot. And, and that's, that's, that's trucks, parked. vans, work vehicles, and um, police uh, right. vehicles. First responder type vehicles. First responder vehicles, yeah. Yes. Oh, well, that's a big change. Yes, it is. And it'll go through the courts, but in the meantime, um, again, this is something you got to seek your individual association's legal advice. But um, it, I mean, it is the law of the land until it's not. Well, and it's interesting to try to figure out or parse the language in terms of what is a work vehicle, because I believe the new statute explicitly allows you to continue to regulate commercial vehicles parked on your property. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you distinguish a quotes work vehicle from a commercial vehicle. Um, a, a work vehicle may have the company logo on the driver's side and passenger side door. A commercial vehicle may have, you know, tools and ladders and other stuff hanging off the side. This is a provision that is going to have to be fleshed out, maybe through a glitch bill, maybe through decisions from the state or the courts. But it is, I'm glad you pointed it out, James, it is an important change with regard to the parking of vehicles. And it's going to apply especially to uh, communities where people don't have a garage. Yeah. Well, I know we probably left our audience unsatisfied on this one, but I, I really recommend you get some specific legal advice. Um, it is a new law. It, it may or may not survive, but uh, you, all of our owners are going to take advantage of it. We know that. Uh, I know I've only got one minute left, but I, I'm going to uh, take the liberty if we go over a minute or two here, Ken. I, I wrote down kind of a list of things that we were recommending subject to legal advice from your own counsel. But w number one was re-engage members as it relates to electronic communications. There is more information as a result of these, this legislation that needs to get out. And it's so much easier and in, more in, and inexpensive to do it um, uh, electronically. So two was update your website. There's been enough change in law that we need to update everyone's website. Three, update board conflict of interest policy. We didn't talk a lot about that, um, but uh, House Bill, what is it, 10? Uh, 21. First one is 21 has a lot of information on that. Uh, update records retention policy, update records inspection policy, um, uh, update your board meeting participation policy, adopt guidelines for permissible hurricane protection. And the last one, I think the reason I listed that, Ken, was did, is, there, is there enough change here that we need to look at possibly amending our documents, Ken? Is it, has it reached that point? I, I think that has always been a worthy consideration for communities. Because if you're still working from documents the developer drafted, um, especially if you're 40, 50 years old, uh, developers draft documents for the purpose of selling units, not for operating a post turnover community. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll finish and I'll, do, I'll give you the elevator speech version of this. It's a much longer discussion with your council. The reasons to update your documents are to bring it up to date with the statute, which changes every year. Number two, to remove obsolete references to the builder. Number three, to clarify the guidelines for who's responsible for maintaining or repairing what. Number four, to address the guidelines for alterations or renovations, whether by the owners or by the association. To address eligibility criteria for the board. Um, and also to address that whole panoply of use restrictions from guest occupancy. We live in the era of Airbnb uh, to address pets, to address leasing, even though there are new statutory requirements that make some of those leasing restrictions unenforceable against owners who don't vote for them. 
have a fulsome discussion with your association council about what the benefits would be for updating your documents. And for most of you, the best practical advice I could give you is maybe the only amendment you need to do right now is to amend the amendatory clauses to make them feasible. Interesting. Wow, that was a powerful 62 minutes, Ken. I am so grateful and I know our audience is so grateful. Uh, this is the time where you and your peers in the industry are adding so much value to uh, all of us that feel like deer in headlights. Um, so I'll just end with uh, uh, thank you to everyone on this call for leading your communities. Thank you, Ken, for your, uh, your thoughts and uh, strongly recommend everyone uh, digest this and, and run it by their legal counsel because there's enough nuance here. We don't want to do it without that guidance. And I think it's fair to say, James, we only scratched the surface of all the details in this new yeah. law. So yeah. I appreciate being invited to join you. It's always my pleasure. Have a great summer, everybody. And um, we are back uh, next month with my partner, Craig Vaughn. Uh, so we look forward to talking to you again then. And um, we will post uh, the link that you've been asking for for the Corporate Transparency Act uh, on the Council Group website. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.